Uh, welcome back to Comic Book Historians. I'm Alex Grand. Go ahead and click on that juicy red subscribe button down below. Now today, before we get into the history of video games and comics, I want you to consider picking up a copy of the graphic novel I wrote with artist Sebastián Guidobono called Journey to Mexico, available in English and Spanish. Also, an interview book I put together with my podcast co-host, Jim Thompson, Frank Thorne the Blue, Wizard of the Comic Arts, all available on Amazon and other online book retailers. Now, as far as video games, that's a whole nother entertainment system with its own properties and its own mythologies. But there is an intersection between comic books and video games that it's good to know as they share some overlap in their mutual histories. For the later Generation X crowd and the early Millennials, video games were a huge deal. A lot of the terminology that kids would use with each other, Atari, Commodore 64, Nintendo, was huge. And a lot of times we would be reading comic books and also be playing video games. Well, there is a line of convergence between the two when a lot of comic book artists or writers were also writing or design or developing video games. Also the inverse, a lot of the topics of video games would be comic characters like Superman. This all starts with Atari started in 1972, which was sold to Warner Communications in 1976 and a couple years later there would be a product of corporate synergy since Warner also owned DC Comics. Hence, the 1978 Atari 2600 game, Superman. Jeanette Kahn was a major force at DC Comics. She became publisher in 1976, and by 1978, she was a significant player in trying to bring together the lucrative comics with video games in hopes to create some sort of product synergy, especially at Warner that owned both DC Comics and Atari. She employed the likes of writers like Elliot S. Magan, who wrote a memo about, quote-unquote, interactive fiction, which he feels he created. This is certainly at play in video games, especially this early Superman game, where this pixelated red and blue figure puts criminals in jail and repairs a bridge. Although the sound and graphics of this game are extremely primitive by today's standards, it opened a door where a comic character was first put into this medium. Next, in 1982, Jerry Conway and Roy Thomas worked at DC and wrote mini-comics that accompanied some of the Atari games with art by Ross Andrew, Gil Kane, Mike DiCarlo, and Dick Giordano. In 1983, Elliot S. Magan wrote DC Comics' first self-described graphic novel, Star Raiders, with art by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. And Jerry Conway would also write the second volume of Atari Force in 1984 with art again by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, which Conway attests that he enjoyed far more than the first. Despite these promotions by DC Comics, Atari still couldn't survive the market saturation of various console types, and the waning interest overall in consoles resulted in the video game crash of 1983. A year before that crash, though, Marvel would contract with Parker Brothers and Atari for the 1982 Spider-Man video game, where again, the hero was a red and blue pixelated figure with a black line as a swinging web to distinguish it from Superman. Fans were excited, though, to imagine themselves as Spider-Man squaring off against Green Goblin, and the promotional material is pretty awesome. Although this video game appears really ancient looking back on it now, the commercials for it are pretty badass. Honestly, a lot of fans wouldn't mind right now having a 26 episode order, half hour each, of the theatrics that went into these commercials. These two live action costume characters from the commercials got together again with Stan Lee in the first video game news magazine made by Marvel called Blip in 1983 for a sensational promotion. In 1984, Quest Probe was released for Atari 800 and Apple II, which interacted with a slew of Marvel characters in the Marvel Universe. Quest Probe was also a 1984 Marvel comic series that tied into the Atari Apple game of the same year, featuring work by Scott Adams, John Byrne, Al Milgram, Ron Wilson, John Romita, and Mark Grunewald. It aborted after three issues, and the Quest Probe video game publisher Adventure International went bankrupt. Some of the material continued into Marvel Fanfare 33 1987, which had more art from the video game series. In 1988, 
Taito released Superman the Arcade Game, which employed a horizontal flying gameplay and two players could either be Blue Standard Superman or the Red Superman, which many feel was actually Mon-El from the Legion of Superheroes. Although the company Nintendo was founded more than 100 years ago in 1889, it actually achieved international acclaim for its Nintendo Entertainment System home console in 1985, which revitalized interest in the home console market after the Atari implosion of the early 1980s. Their game, The Uncanny X-Men in 1989, definitely capitalized on X-Men fandom generated by Chris Claremont, but didn't deliver the excitement that many fans were expecting. Cyclops' beam wasn't that powerful, Colossus wasn't that strong, and Wolverine wasn't that invulnerable. Nintendo faced some competition, though, from the 1960-founded company Sega. And in 1989, Sega Genesis, The Revenge of Shinobi, had unlicensed appearances by Batman and Spider-Man, who are actual boss characters in the game. You can tell the graphics really start to hit their stride in the later 1980s. Marvel gave consent for the second version of the game to continue the use of Spider-Man for the Shinobi game, but DC would not, which had the video game makers change Batman into a Bat Monster. Batman would make a very fun appearance that same year for Sega Genesis in his own game, however, by Sunsoft to celebrate the recently released Tim Burton film. The 1990 Batman the video game is still seen by modern fans as pretty darn wonderful despite its 8-bit limitations. It really is seen as maximizing the technology. In 1992, its sequel, Batman The Return of the Joker, was seen as a graphics triumph since it was 16-bit and came with a 16-bit processor that was attached to the game. The 1990s would see an upsurge in quality, especially in the arcade arena, with Data East 1991, Captain America and the Avengers, which had a street-level beat-em-up type of gameplay experience that mixed in the horizontal flight mode of the earlier Superman arcade game. This game had classic Avengers like Captain America, Hawkeye, Iron Man, and the Vision, but also interacting with characters like Submariner, Juggernaut, Ultron, and the Red Skull. Anyone that loved the Marvel Universe at the time generally would pay $5 minimum in quarters just to complete the game. Konami had their eyes set up taken on Data East with X-Men the Arcade Game in 1992, which was very similar to the previous Captain America game, but zoomed into the action where the playable characters were larger in size and facing off against an X-Men rogues gallery like Juggernaut, Magneto, and the Sentinels. Players could be Nightcrawler, Wolverine, Dazzler, Storm, Cyclops, and Colossus, and its aesthetic is very much in the style of the failed X-Men cartoon pilot 1989's Pride of the X-Men. In 1994, Capcom, the makers of Street Fighter II, would release X-Men, Children of the Atom, which was a versus fighter game that also swallowed up a lot of quarters and eventually evolved into 1998's Marvel vs. Capcom. Since the 1990s was the extreme age, one of its elements was a large number of intercompany crossovers, and this was reflected in the 1996 game Iron Man and Exo Manowar in Heavy Metal, which also had its own comic book. Interesting side note is that Jim Shooter and Bob Layton started and created the Valiant comics, and that it was their character, Exo Manowar, that they allowed to be in the same game universe as Marvel's Iron Man. This sort of video game technology would evolve into some notable games in the 21st century that employed comic book writers and artists like X-Men Legends for PlayStation 2, Xbox, and GameCube in 2004, and then also Marvel Ultimate Alliance in 2006, and then of course Mortal Kombat vs. DC in 2008. And there are many more video games going into the 21st century that star comic book characters or employ comic book creators. But the interesting thing is to see where it all started in the late 70s, 80s, and 90s to become what we know today as comic books intersecting with video games.